I'm Trevor Graff. Welcome to Media Crossroads for today's conversation with former NASA astronaut and astronomer Stephen Hawley. Dr. Hawley is a professor and engineering physics director in astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Kansas. In the 1980s and 90s, he spent 32 days in space over the course of five separate NASA missions. Dr. Hawley, welcome to Media Crossroads. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, you came from a, a relatively small town in Kansas, in Salina. Um, how did you get your start in astronomy and eventually with NASA? Well, my interest in astronomy goes way, way back, probably so far that it's hard for me to remember what initially got me interested. I remember uh, even in second and third grade, I was, I was very interested in, in space and astronomy. Part of that, I think, was because of my grandfather, who was a physics professor at Ottawa University. Um, and that just uh, got me to start reading books about astronomy. And I think one of the things that really fascinated me was how astronomers figure things out. Mm -hmm. Because I realized that unlike chemists or biologists or physicists, astronomers can't really conduct experiments. Mm -hmm. And so whatever astronomers learn, they learn just by looking and being clever. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. And then when I was in grade school, Al Shepard flew the first Mercury flight, and the whole idea of people in space uh, fascinated me. And I was one of the geeks that followed all of the missions back then, and I knew the names of all the astronauts, although realistically I didn't think there'd ever be a chance for me to uh, become part of that. I just felt that one day I'd hopefully get a degree in astronomy and be able to become a professional astronomer. Now, there were three Kansas astronauts that, that flew in space flights. Is there Anything about the area that may have you know, led to some commonality there? And no. Maybe it's KU. They were all KU grads. <laughs> there you go. Joe Engel was a, and, and Ron Evans were both uh, graduates of the School of Engineering. Mm -hmm. And I was a graduate in the college from uh, physics and astronomy. And you were selected by NASA into the space program um, in January of 78. Uh, at, at that point, you've come a long way. You've been through school, obviously. Had you done much research work with the, the observatories at that point? Or? I, had, uh, I had my PhD at that point, and mm -hmm. I had, was in the process of uh, um, doing a postdoc tour at a big observatory in South America mm -hmm. when I applied and got hired by NASA. So um, it was an interesting career decision. I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> I didn't have to think more in a microsecond before I decided to accept the NASA job, but I realized I was giving up uh, potentially a career in, in research to, to go uh, work for NASA and pursue this opportunity to fly in space. But at the time I felt, you know, this is basically your once in a lifetime opportunity, so. So what, what happens at that point? You've exited research, not totally, but in general, and you're making the move to become an astronaut. Uh, that has to be a lot of physical training and a lot of flight training involved. It is, and, and it's a lot, frankly, of focusing more on engineering mm -hmm. and less on the research. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important to have uh, people with research backgrounds in those positions, not so much because you actually do your own research, but because you understand the conduct of research and you understand the scientific objectives that researchers who go to space are trying to achieve. And uh, one of the things I think was beneficial uh, when I was ultimately assigned to the Hubble telescope missions was the fact that I understood the, the space flight side of things, but I also understood the astronomy side of things. And so I could act as a go-between when there were conflicts between the science and the scientific objectives and the ops team and what the ops team felt they needed to do. And, and sometimes I could go advocate for the science and sometimes I would advocate with the scientists for the operations approach. And, and that was possible just because of my background in astronomy and that I had at least some credibility in, in research. And how much time in that, in that span between 1978 and 1984 did you stop and think a little bit about, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strap into a space shuttle and fly to space? Mostly during that time, before my first flight, mm -hmm. I was focused on doing whatever it took to prove that I really belonged there. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I, I worried about when I was selected is that, you know, here I'm competing with, you know, military test pilots. Not, not competing necessarily, but, but I'm having to perform uh, 
in this group that has military test pilots, has you know engineers, a variety of people from different backgrounds that are very well qualified, and and you know, do I really have the aptitude and the background to be successful at this? And so um, that was really my focus. I wasn't thinking about you know mm -hmm. getting a flight assignment at the time. I was just trying to um, do what I could do to prove that that they had not made a bad choice when they selected me. And what aspect of that training was, was toughest for you? What, what did you struggle with most? Um, I don't remember struggling with anything in particular. In fact, I found it um, kind of interesting because, ironically, we pick people that are accomplished in some specific field. In my case, astronomy, as mm -hmm. I mentioned. In other cases, you know, military test pilots, flight engineers, uh, uh, people with advanced degrees in various engineering disciplines, but we teach the astronauts uh, a variety of disciplines. You know, I learned medicine, I learned flying, I learned uh, geology, oceanography, engineering, things that I had never really had a lot of exposure to before, and I thought that was really interesting to get uh, a chance to learn about all these diverse areas. and. Um, you know, flying was different. I had never flown before, so mm -hmm. learning how to fly the jets was was challenging. But but I enjoyed that. Um, but I wouldn't no I wouldn't say that anything was particularly difficult. Um, your first mission was uh, set to launch August thirtieth, nineteen eighty four. It was the first discovery mission. Right. Uh, was it a little scary, maybe, to know that you were the first one to? to fly in the Discovery Shuttle? No, by then we had launched two other shuttles. Yeah. And um, in fact, it was sort of uh, enjoyable. You know, I viewed it even as a bit of a privilege to get to be the first crew to fly a mm -hmm. orbiter. Um, uh, you know, yeah, recognizing it had not flown before, so it was kind of a shakedown mission to see how the orbiter would perform. But, but we had a lot of confidence that by 1984 we had a pretty good idea of what we were doing. So at that point, you're selected to a flight crew. Um, what's that process like? How do they, they vet the candidates for a, f a mission? And that was always one of the big mysteries, <laughs> is how they did that. Um, it was even a mystery to me when I got to be the person that helped select astronauts mm -hmm. later on. Um, you, you consider a lot of different factors uh, when you put a crew together. Um, one of the factors is you want a mix of experience and inexperience. I mean, you got to... Uh, sort of work the rookies into the, the flight program so that they can become experienced and, and then lead crews later on. Um, you need to find the right skill set uh, in the crew to do whatever the mission may require. Uh, sometimes there's a spacewalk scheduled, so you want people that are good at that. Sometimes there's um, a robotics intensive objective of some kind. Hubble was like that. In fact, Hubble had both spacewalking and robotics, very intensive. And so you want people that are good at robotics. Um, so, and, and who's available? I mean, there may be somebody that would be ideal for this mission, but that individual happens to have just returned from a flight or is already assigned to a different flight and, and he or she may not be available. So there's a whole bunch of factors. You may want this individual for another mission downstream. And if he's assigned to this mission, he won't be available. So. There's a, a whole bunch of factors that you have to take into account. Also, there's a little bit of uh, you know how the crew works well together, mm -hmm. um, so you want to uh, take that into account. It's a little bit of an art, I suppose. There's no you know uh, strict way to do it, but uh, we were generally pretty successful at putting crews together that worked. At that point, you're chosen. You have your flight. It's all about training and preparation for the flight. Do you have time to step back and think about what you're about to do, and does that weigh on your mind much, or are you? I would say it was common. It was certainly true in my case that, that what I was thinking about was that you know getting this opportunity was what I had signed up for. Mm -hmm. And so uh, now that I've been given the assignment, the next job is to make sure that you perform uh, the mission properly, um, and you know, I, I don't think you focus on what you're about to do sort of as an experience. Mm -hmm. You realize that you know you've achieved this milestone of now 
having been given this opportunity, and so your focus is, you know, how do I make sure that given this opportunity, I do the best job I can possibly do? 